Hello and welcome to another pub session in the Mary Rose. Oh, it's mad in here tonight. Uh, starting us off, we've got Merrin, who has corona vaccine side effects combined with too much neurofen combined with <laughs> um, wine, which means that she's now, and this is possibly, this is even like, I reckon Johnny couldn't out middle class this. She has broken the neck off a 19th century claret jug. Is that right? It's, it's been a good day so far, yes. <laughs> Erin <laughs> is keeping it real up there in North Norfolk and not going oh, yeah. to at all. Charlie and ages. Chris, who's blatantly loitering in the background. Come on to camera, Chris. Come on, Chris. Come on, Chris. Here he comes. These two kids still at work. celebrate their 10th anniversary oh, tomorrow. Oh, yeah. 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 And you know hard, what he did for her birthday last year? It's going to make the rest of you gag because it's so lovely. <laughs> Took her to stay somewhere that Charles II had stayed. Oh, up an oak tree. Yeah. Up an oak tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we did out there, love. Enjoy yourself. We it's did that on um, Oak Apple Day in May. But <laughs> it's not that travel lodge just outside Banbury where he stayed for a night, was it? Oh, we love to travel lodge. <laughs> love to travel. Definitely, definitely wasn't where I thought you were going with the gag reference, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> God, ten, right. ten years. You get less than that for drawing a statue. <laughs> oh. <laughs> our favourite, our favourite mouthy lefties in the house. You're right, Clive. I'm very well, thank you. I can't wait to see it. I, this is brilliant because I know where your one is set tonight, and I want to hear if they're copying as well because it would be rather funny. Oh, if you're going to be surprised. Just wait, just wait. We also have a birthday in the house. Heather is. 25 today that's at least what we're telling everyone she's nodding <laughs> yeah happy birthday heather thank you she had to go to work she was at work by like 4 a.m uh but they bought her cookies so if heather runs away it's because her parents are taking her out for dinner and she's getting a free meal so we don't hold it against her at all uh, we also have our favorite little obi ginge kenobi <laughs> uh, <laughs> The Kaiser, as he like, he would like to be called by women, and that's usually why they don't ask for a second date. You're right, Chris. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I've been up to my neck in um, British and French seamen all week, um, preparing for the 18th for the 18th of March uh, Tweeter Farm. <laughs> I'm about to push on the Dardanelles. Back. Nothing. Else. <laughs> I think a skissel just came out of Beth's nose. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my see, work I here is done. The fact that Chris has no shame. Chris, tell everyone about the exchange you had with your boss this week at work. Uh, yeah, um, my uh, my manager said um, that's all right. We'll, we'll take the boy, and I said I'm not a boy. I'm 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 40 years old. I'm a, my own man. I have my own keys and my own security pass, and I, I waved my security pass at him. And uh, my other boss, Caroline, looked around and said, "Isn't that a Hufflepuff lanyard?" Like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, James is in the house. James is already dropping massive hints about his birthday next week. Apparently, he's going to be seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> no, add ten years. No, it's just I'm trying to get myself in the birthday mood, uh, especially as my birthday got ruined last year thanks COVID. So, uh, yeah, um, I hate to break it to you, James, but I think nothing much is going to change by next week. COVID's going to shit all over this one as well. I'm we'll trying to be positive. We'll up for it afterwards. <laughs> uh, we also have, who do we have in the house? Beth is in the house. She's just snorted Skittles through her nose um, at Chris's semen confession, haven't you? Indeed I have. It's not Skittles though today. It's um, fizzy cola straws, but I've already run out. So it is a dilemma. Have you got an emergency stash outside in the hallway? I've got chocolate. Yeah, <laughs> thought you might have. Uh, Lockie uh, was getting into the mood yesterday for St Dorman's Day uh, because he had uh, potatoes and Guinness, like a raw potato and Guinness. Yeah, I did turn them into a kind of uh, pretty bland stew, actually. So that's that's pretty Irish, isn't it? Um, uh, in other news, I'm sort of drowning in books as well. So um, this is nice. Nice to nice to get away from the book drowning. We have also got, who have we got? We've got our judges in the house. We've got Holmes. You're right, Holmes. Not too bad. I mean, bad news for me and my lot about the vaccine yesterday, especially because I 
I'm in my late forties, and I, I tend to hang around with people in their fifties, like Johnny and stuff like that. So I'm slightly <laughs> concerned that in about three weeks' time, they'll be out and going crazy ape shit. Well, I'll be stuck here with my son, pretending I enjoy BBC Three. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I'm rather pleased that I got my jab in when I did. What are they doing? Are they prioritising second jabs over first jabs now? I think so. Yeah, I I'm not. I'm not going to get until May. May, I don't think. Oh. Clive, Clive will be on his sixth or something by then, won't he? <laughs> <laughs> so I will just be I'll probably have died about the causes uh, live from a beach in the Bahamas or whatever going and we were hating for it uh, right again we've got our other judge tonight it's Boney you alright Boney good evening good evening I'm well you haven't you? jabbed yet have you no not old enough <laughs> how's it been what, so we have done what have we done between us I want to say thank you to everybody in this room who's helped with um, getting episodes done while Alina has been on holiday. So we recorded nine weeks content in nine days. I don't know what day what? it is right now, but we have recorded nine weeks content in nine days. For all of you that jumped on and co-hosted, thank you so much. We love you. We owe you many, many drinks when this is over. <laughs> um, right, that's enough of being nice. We're here today to discuss the greatest night out in history. So what do you think would have been the best night in history? Uh, we may have more people dropping in throughout the course of the night. I know Alina's got one that she wants to do, but she's probably chasing a stupid staffy around a garden somewhere in Poland. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right, OK, so let's start with... Oh, I actually have no clue mostly what people are doing tonight. I'm going to start with Beth. Oh, no, please don't start with me. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Beth, are you unprepared? A little bit. <laughs> uh, right, third time lucky. Who should we start with? Let's start with let's start with Ginge before he gets drunk and starts <laughs> taking his clothes off like every other week. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, that kind of fits in quite nicely with what I've chosen um, because uh, this uh, greatest night out in history was had by the greatest party animals in history. You can keep your Roman orgies, your medieval banquets, your Viking hog roasts, and your pre um, pre certain apocalypse piss ups. The greatest party parties in the world are no, sadly not the Germans, but the Navy. And Admiral Edward Russell held the greatest party of them all. And in 1694, whilst um, leading the Mediterranean fleet back to England for the winter, he was instead told to uh, winter at Cadiz. He threw his toys out the pram and sent a message back saying, I'm at present under no, under a doubt with myself whether it is not better to die. So when they got to Cadiz, he decided, let's have a Christmas party that we won't forget. So they took over Governor Don Francesco del Valesco Yatova's state um, and set up a banquet with over 150 dishes, which was laid, out, laid on for 800 men. Although I did read somewhere that it might have been up to 5,000. No one's quite sure because of the centerpiece. Now, the Royal Navy do two things very well. One of them is beating the French, and the other one is hard drinking. They took the fountain in the centre of the garden and filled it with 250 gallons of brandy, 125 gallons of wine, 1,400 pounds of sugar, 2,500 lemons, 20 gallons of lime juice, 5 pounds of nutmeg, which was all mixed together. They then um, put a giant silken... Um, cover over the top of the uh, fountain so that when it rained it wouldn't water down the booze. They then proceeded to get absolutely sloshed but instead of just going up and filling up the cups they actually set up had waiters in little boats floating around the fountain to fill up cups and hand them out to the, to the officers. Unfortunately because of the, the fumes coming off the fountain they had to rotate the waiters every 15 minutes before they became overcome but the navy being the navy as soon as all the toasts and the meals, had, meal etiquette had been served, everyone just jumped into the fountain and started drinking. This went on for five days until they drained the entire fountain. At one point, um, one of the waiter's boats was knocked over and he fell in and couldn't swim. Instead of the sailors rushing forward and saying, let's get this guy out, the solution was, drink up, lads, we'll drain the fountain, which they did and saved his life. Um, there was also, they think, music and more food, uh, possibly women, but no one, I, I couldn't find any serious um, versions of what actually happened. And that's because I think they were that pissed for five days that no one actually remembers. Much like me in the uh, Down the Pub Christmas special, it's probably <laughs> best that they don't know what happened. They just have to rely on some of the pictures that might have turned up later. 
but that is um, that is possibly the greatest night in history until a pub reopens and we can all go to the pub and make it create our own. Although I'm probably not going to drink that much um, punch. Brilliant! Uh, I love that they just fucking canned mixing drinks and just mixed them in a fountain. And I love that yeah. they have the foresight. <laughs> Lockie, as a former bar manager, will appreciate fully the fact that they even added the nutmeg to get the mixology right in the fountain. This is outstanding. Go on, give the Navy some credit, Holmes. You boaty hating bastard. <laughs> it's it's a, it's initially quite impressive. I think it loses marks for the, the variety of drinks that are available. To be honest, what a brandy wine and nutmeg and lemon and lime seems like doesn't seem that doesn't seem that nice to me. And it might get it might get a bit repetitive after a while. I mean, is there any evidence of this? Are they like? paintings or sketches or lithographs um yeah i did see one painting and it's it's sort of become um it's the world it was the world record for the greatest amount of booze in one place at one party up until um fairly at some point in the 20th century yeah i think that was mine sorry (laughs) (laughs) you you said that it happened in 1694 did i write that down incorrectly yes 1694 and you're telling me they kept world records in 1694. I mean, Norris McGuire was old when I was little, but I didn't think he was. <laughs> it was sort of based on the amount that they claimed to have drunk, and you know, if it was up to five thousand sailors, that's just a weekend. And and the other the other the other thing, which I, I do like the story overall, but the other, other thing which causes me to doubt it is a little bit is the story about the waiter that fell in. Now, how long does it take somebody to drown normally? About three minutes, I think. Yeah. I mean, legit- but then it, it, it depends. It depends how full the fountain was at that point. I mean, you can drown in up to three inches of of liquid. So if they all had to drink three inches of liquid, that that should have been should have been. Yeah, I think that, that <laughs> might that might be embellished slightly. That element of the story. But they but they were <laughs> that pissed if they'd been drinking for five days. I I think some guy almost drowned. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> true. True. Only. Are you going to give the Navy some credit? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it 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 started well. It tailed off in the middle, and then just sort of kept kept going. I thought. Um, I started. Just I'm I'm taking this seriously. Check it out. I'm, I'm making notes and everything. Um, yeah. Because um, Holmes said he'd ha- he'd never speak to me again if I didn't, and I'm sort of torn whether that's reason to take notes or not. But. I've, I've actually started spent two days on a on a down the pub judging course. He's got like eight seats. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started jotting down the amount of booze, and then I stopped and just wrote worst cocktail ever. Um, <laughs> and to be fair, if it took five days to drink it, these being navy chaps, surely the last two days it was just piss. So <laughs> probably more than likely. <laughs> it does depend so on the size I, of the fountain. I think maybe the, the the first the first day might have been. A good one, um, but you know, I'd, I I like the idea of drunk waiters and boats because that, that that just It'd be like dodgems, but with boats mm. in a fountain full of booze. And it's then you just know boat. someone's going to start shooting at them. This actually reminds me <laughs> today that uh, I can't remember what we were celebrating. I cannot remember, but I do know that I was with my brother and one of his friends in Trafalgar Square, and we ended up swimming front crawling laps of the fountain in Trafalgar Square until we were busted by a heritage warden that tried to convince us that the water was poisonous and would kill us <laughs> out right, right away, uh, to which I was like, well, that's a lie. And I just remember the three of us sitting there sopping wet on the train home. Um, and I cannot for the life of me remember what the gathering was for in Trafalgar Square, but it was fun. I, I did a similar thing. It was either in Le Mans, it was in France, it was either in Le Mans or Angers. Angers. We were travelling on the way down there and we got really pissed. It was before we had kids. And there was a tiny fountain in the middle of the square. And I said, I, I bet I could do that underwater. It's about 20 metres. It was about nine inches deep. But I did manage to do the whole thing underwater. I cut my legs. There was loads of broken bottles in there and stuff. And then I went and sat at one of the bars around the square afterwards. And no one would serve me. Because it was like I disrespected the town by doing this length of underwater in the town fountain. Holmes, when you say it was before you had kids, I want to point out that there's only been one kid in your house for the eight years that I've known oh, you. I meant, I meant you the appear to have misplaced one, at least one. <laughs> if you're yeah, we've all done that. 
when I when I submerged in that French fountain, and I'm sure there were two sat on the wall, but when I came out the other, <laughs> other <way>. yeah. <laughs> oh, worrying me, Chris is like, yeah, I just place mine all the time. <laughs> Two in one day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay, uh, I like that one. I think it's great. I love that the Royal Naval have got uh, Royal Navy have got a show in. Um, it's just disturbing. Let's go to Beth, who is ready now. I am ready now. Yes. So, oh, I have to work. <laughs> work distracted me from my usual level of preparation. But I'm there. I'm there. So, for, for my best night out, I've gone with a little bit of a hypothetical because there's not much written about it. So, I've kind of thought I'll build up a bit of a picture. And the picture that I'm going to build is of the 29th of May, 1660. Oh, Char- Charlie, I'm so happy. <laughs> this is so bad for your Disney oh. <laughs> The 29th of May, 1660, was the day that King Charles II returned to London after his exile of 10 years. And very brief rundown, he'd escaped England in 1651 and spent much of the next decade on the move across Europe, spending time with the French court in Cologne and in Bruges, to name just a few places. And as we all know, history hacks worst enemy and most hated character, Oliver Cromwell, boo, everyone, boo, died. He died in September 1658, thankfully, with his son Richard being proclaimed Lord Protector. And this is a key moment in history. It drastically alters the very delicate balance of power that exists in London at the time. And eventually, with many to and fro and whatnot, by April 1659, Richard Cromwell was overthrown by the army. This was not immediately the beginning of the restoration for Charles, because England was still a very tetchy place to be. Um, so he still spent his time in Europe, trying to find some sort of channels of communication, trying to find any way that he could to get back into England. Um, And eventually, in stepped General George Monk, commander of the army in Scotland. Um, It was his entry into England, followed by his arrival in London in February, that brought about the end of the Republic experiment and ushered in Charles's return in May. Um, When the declaration was delivered to the Parliament on the 1st of May 1660, it was accepted by the firstly by the reconvened House of Lords and then by the Commons. And on the 8th of May, Charles was proclaimed as monarch. The way was now clear for him to depart the Netherlands where he was residing at the time and sailed for Dover and landed there on the 25th of May 1660. The Venetian ambassador, Francesco Giavarini, rushed to Dover to greet the king and accompanied him back to London. The best night out in history, the 29th of May, 1660. Not only is it the day Charles arrived back in London, it was also Charles's 30th birthday. Oh, I sense, I sense a piss what, coming. What a day. No, <laughs> I'm not old enough yet, but I can imagine when my 30th birthday comes, that will be a, a cracking day. <laughs> Sorry about that. I imagine but, when it comes, you'll be shit-faced by half seven, if I'm honest, but carry oh, on. Probably. <laughs> Absolutely, of course I will be, you know, start as I mean to go on. And, you know, compared to what I'm about to say, the, the everyday lives of ordinary people in England had been shit um most sports had been banned drunkenness and even swearing was punished with a fine we'd all be fined i'm sure in relation for that non-religious expressions of christmas the best time of year had been stopped many drinking establishments were closed as were all the theaters which is oddly comparable to today women who were caught working on sundays were put in the stocks and shame Bright clothes were banned and sober dress was the order of the day. Makeup was scrubbed off girls' faces by soldiers who caught them wearing it. So generally, all in all, life had been pretty shit without a monarchy with Cromwell in charge. So Tuesday, the 29th of March, we do actually have a a first hand um, account from that Venetian ambassador, Giovarini. And this is what he writes about the day. On Tuesday, the 29th of March, his 30th 
birthday, he entered London on horseback between his two brothers and surrounded by a crowd of the nobility, with great pomp and triumph, and in the most stately manner ever seen, amid the acclamations and blessings of the people beyond all expression. The mayor and magistrates of the city met him and tendered him the customary tributes, and he passed from one end to the other of this very long city, between the foot soldiers who kept the streets open, raising his eyes to the windows, looking at all, raising his hat to all, and consoling all, all who were with loud shouts, and a tremendous noise acclaimed the return of this great prince, so abounding in virtues and distinguishing qualities of every sort. Through his this great crowd he proceeded to Whitehall where he remains, and where so far he has allowed no rest, showing himself at every moment to the people who press impetuously forward to offer their devotion to their sovereign. He takes his meals in public, and by his royal presence affords his people the utmost consolation and enjoyment. For three days and three nights they have lighted bonfires and made merry, burning effigies of Cromwell and other rebels with much abuse. The foreign ministers have taken part in these rejoicings, and I also, in addition to the illuminations, have kept before the door a fountain of wine and other liquors, according to the custom of the country, much to the delight of the people and amid many acclamations. Now, I think, as lovely as that is, this is just a really stuffy way of the Venetian ambassador saying that basically everyone got really, really pissed and had a lot of fun. Those three days, other than that writing that I found, there's not much to it. It's a bit of a, you know, got to use your imagination. But we all know what the reign of King Charles II was like. He was known as the Merry Monarch for a reason, for his lavish and hedonistic lifestyle. This tall, handsome, charming and suave king who was welcomed back with open, arm, open arms and loved by the nation. Surely this would have been an absolute rager of a 30th birthday party. There would have been booze, food, music and I imagine as well lots and lots of sex. Even by the standards of the European courts of the day there was a lot of sex in the court of Charles II. Sex behind closed doors, sex in public places, and most likely orgies as well, I would imagine at some point went on during those three days of celebration. On top of all of that, and who doesn't love a, who doesn't love a bit of a activities, um, there's going to be booze and food, two of the best things in the world, aside from the sex, of course. Music, who doesn't love a good party without music? You can just imagine the, you know, the 21st, the six, the seventeenth century version of Mr. Brightside, everyone banging their heads, <laughs> party. So, those three days, besides the very astute uh, description from the ambassador, there's not much to go on. But I think we can all say, without a doubt, those three days at the end of May, sixteen sixty, would have been the best night out in history, probably because they didn't sleep. So it would have all been one in one go. No sleep. That is the best night out in history. Well done. Charlie's impressed. Oh, I'm so impressed. What a party. You think yeah, she's right? I mean, that is a, what that is a party I want to be at. Do you know what? There is, there is shockingly little written in the days after the restoration and I think you are right I think everyone was just too hung over to sit and write anything. Yeah everyone got too pissed they thought what the what the hell did we actually do? <laughs> <laughs> One thing we hard. do know is that he did get an early night that first night back because he was meant to go to Westminster Abbey so he rode through um through London it took hours and hours and hours and you're right everyone was out there partying and wanting to say hello and he's waving at everybody and doing all of that then he has to greet all of the, the hoi polloi and he says, where are all my enemies? Because you guys love me so much. Why have I been away 11 years? Um, and then everyone's going to Westminster Abbey, but he's knackered and he goes to bed. And nine months later, pretty much to the day, Barbara Villiers gives birth to their daughter. So I think we know what he was up to that night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, yeah. We can all agree that is a party we would want to be at. That is a party. Yeah. <laughs> He sounds a little bit too fertile for me. I wouldn't want him anywhere okay. today. <laughs> Matt, what do you think? Uh, sounds a bit like my 30th, really. 
I, I can't remember my 30th. I, I don't want to piss on all your young people's chips, but yeah, they fade away. I'd, I'd actually forgotten it was my birthday. I was in Delhi on business. And they, they went, when's your birthday? And I thought it was 21st of August. And they went, you mean today? And I went, oh, yeah, I'm 30. So there we go. Um, Beth. Matt. How much was the Venetian ambassador owed? Because he was clearly very happy that there was someone who was showing up who might pay the bill. But then yeah. clearly he didn't know Charles. So, you know. Mm. Yeah. Because you know, well, this might be a very nice way of saying it was a rubbish party, but if we tell everyone it was ace, you might pay me. I mean, you could say that, but as you know, I did say he is known for these lavish parties and the money that he spent on his mistresses and you know debts and gambling and alcohol. Like it for him to be for it to be a very astute, prim and proper kind of night. I. I I don't, I can't see that happening. I kind of, I like to think that he kind of kicked open the door to Whitehall in his little patent buckle shoes and went, Daddy's home, bitches. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Definitely. yeah. Guess who's back? <laughs> Charlie, you're saying that the ambassador's account is not the only one. Yeah, it's a, it's... It's echoed by several. John Evelyn writes about the um, the fountains running with wine and um, great tapestries being hung from the windows and beautiful women sort of leaning from said windows, throwing flowers, all of this sort of stuff. It it, it comes across in quite a few. They really scrubbed up London for the day. They they made it as nice as they could. Can we just also absorb in the fact that there's fountains of wine? Well, this is the thing, and this is going with like, Christmas as well. I'm thinking we're missing a trick if we now do a history hack night out when the pubs reopen and don't <laughs> end up at least trying to pour wine into a fountain and drink it. <laughs> and they seem to do accepted. this quite a lot. They seem to do this sort of several times. It's not an isolated incident. No, it's it's not it's not been, in the glasses hadn't been invented by then. What else are you going to drink it out of? <laughs> <laughs> or it's straight. Yeah, great for post-COVID, definitely. Yeah. I'm loving it that uh, Heather, the microbiologist in the room, is just like, germs, germs. <laughs> right, okay, Holmes. I, I, I got similar doubts as, as Matt on this. I mean, there's a Venetian ambassador thing. I think, you, Beth, you mentioned that he was welcomed back by a crowd of nobility, which I think all the, this is a bit like history is written by the victors, and it's only a certain category of people that may have had the big party. I don't even know if by the time he got back, would news of his return have got to the upper reaches of the country? So I, I don't know if this would have been a nationwide celebration either. I was slightly taken back by Beth's insistence that having sex is a traditional way of celebrating a royal occasion. And, that, you know, as I said before, in the Silver Jubilee in 1977, I celebrated by taking part in a three-legged race. There was nothing... I was say, if, you did, if you didn't at least get a blowjob after the interview on Oprah, then you're missing a trick. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what a blowjob was then, so I set up for a packet of uh, sausage and tomato crisps because I did win. The, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm not convinced this is a nationwide celebration and it hasn't there's, there's been... stipulation that it has to be nationwide. Well, I think we said... You know, uh, no, it's just got to be the best night out in history. Yeah, and the that would be an there. absolutely banging night out. That's yeah. true. Would, it, would it have been that different from any other nobility person's night out? Mm. Presumably they used the fountains of wine more than once. They didn't just throw away. And, and surely Not for the last bed... 11 years they hadn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a war before that. If the king had gone to bed early... You would have thought the second night would have been the real good night. Because, you know, it's like, is this really happening? And he's, yep, the king's gone to knock off his mistress. Nice one. And then the next night, everyone's like, right, we found the makeup. Let's do this thing. Yeah, but you know that second night drinking on a hangover where you just get tired and tired of every drink you have? It might have been one of those even. Mm, yeah, good Speak for yourself. Yeah. So, sorry, <laughs> are you two just going to sit here and shit on every party? Is that how this is going to work? Yeah, it is, because look at them. They just will. They just will because they're party poopers. Yes. Oh, good party grief! James poopers. and Beth are agreeing. Things are bad. <laughs> yeah, that's when you know you fucked up. <laughs> right. Uh, James isn't doing one because he couldn't well, be able to prepare. No, no, I am doing one. Oh, just right. Chris took my first choice. Oh well. I, I picked it two weeks ago. 
It was naval. <laughs> in the chat. Don't, you, don't, you don't get any arguments. Unless you could have picked it at 6.31 tonight and you'd have still got him first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I've, I've got a choice, though. Go on. So. Okay, I've, I've gone for a party that lasted nearly 20 days, a party that was two months in the planning, a party that had over 12,000 guests, and nearly bankrupted two nations. I've gone for the Field of the Cloth of Gold, which was done for Henry VIII and Francois I of France as effectively a peace conference, but also as a celebration to celebrate peace between the two nations and also the Holy Roman Empire. At James, the time. I, know, I know this, and I know they had fountains of wine at this one as well, so can we all please stop <laughs> digging up the fountains of wine? <laughs> Well, to be fair, there's only one mention of Fountains of Wine, but this was something that had 18 days of feasts, tournaments, masquerades, and a sea of especially built and elaborate tents. A whole palace was built by the English as well. Yeah, but was... out of MDF, let's be fair, it was like a, a temporary palace. Don't make out like they built like the Tower of London. Oh, no. I agree. It was a temporary palace, although the French called it the Crystal Palace for some reason as well. Um, but yeah, this was like fun, games, tons of food. There was over 200,000 litres of, I think, wine from the English alone. God knows how much of beer. This was just an absolute wild party. 66,000 litres of beer, actually. Food included 98,000 eggs, 2,000 sheep, 13 swans, three porpoises. This was just one absolutely epic, continuous party of fun games. And it's all so well documented. There's so much documentation from both sides of this party. It's just something you can't say isn't the best party in history, especially considering the time. It, Bank, almost bankrupted both nations to put these parties together. And in the end, though, peace didn't last. But, <laughs> I mean, everyone would have been celebrating like it was the end of all the wars. Yeah. Anyway, like I said, quick argument because first choice went. I um, I, I can't get past the fact that they ate flipper, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah, three porpoises. That did surprise me. That's just mean. That's just you my Britishness is offended. Leader. James. Yes. Have you ever been to a party where the host is showing off? Yes. Definitely You've been to a party where the host has showed off. <laughs> it was pants, wasn't it? Uh some of them. Some of them. Because it, it, if if the guy who's running it is having a great time, that doesn't always trickle down. That's what I'm saying. And if you've got sort of M M D M D F palaces. Yeah, you, you know, someone's going to have a leak against one and it's going to fall over, isn't it? I mean, it was an example of royal one-upmanship. They were trying to better each other. So the celebrations and parties would have been more and more elaborate each day. So um, if the Tudors is accurate, then um, they had a wrestling match as well, the two kings. which obviously That is referenced in the official really sources. Great. Really? Did you yep. read all of the official sources in preparing yourself? No, but the <laughs> ones I've been able to access while <laughs> replacing my choice. <laughs> uh, this this wasn't just a piss up though, was it? There was actual like meaning behind it. It was to seal an alliance, and they did so by promising Princess Mary to one of the French offspring. Is that right? Uh, Need to double check that because uh, I haven't got to that bit. I've just been going through all the party stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's been all about the booze. Holmes, what about you? Are you sold? Um, well, A, it's Henry VIII, who I'm not a fan of. I mean, this is it's sort of like just a combination. It's where two premature midlife crises just meet up as well, isn't it? Isn't that of... <laughs> He's young at this point. He's young. That's why I, that's why yeah, I, one was 28, one was 25. Story. Yeah, he's it like... Does, it does seem like a, just a ridiculous showing off, mass, showing off wealth type thing. I'm not... Also, I'm not... James, you said there was something like... You didn't even say there was something like 88,000 eggs. Uh, 98,000, yeah. I mean, back in the day when I used to go to parties, and that was quite a while ago now, but I never once used to think to ask how many eggs would be available before I decided whether I was going or not. Yeah, well, <laughs> to be fair, think about how many English breakfasts that would have been yeah. over 18 days. 
which I mean, it's not my standard it's a standard party snack of choice, a full English, to be honest. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm sort of approaching this on the basis of would would I like to go to one of these and would I enjoy it? And I don't think that would be the case with this one. Fair enough. Or, organized fun. Right. Okay. Let's. Oh, Alina's in the house. Alina, welcome. She looks really confused. I have a feeling my internet is really bad, so I'm just going to reset it, and I shall be back in a moment. Okay. On that note, let's all go and get some more drink because I've run out, and that just shouldn't be allowed. Uh, and then we will come back and do the rest. Okay, we're back. Uh, Alina is properly with us now. Her internet stopped playing about. Um, and she's dressed up like in costume and everything for Chris just to impress him tonight, which is great. I've decided that the greatest PR thing ever, and Merrin's going to nod straight away, would be a history hat wedding. Um, and it's you two I've picked. So uh, basically, this is now my mission in life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Poor Chris. <laughs> mate chris chris loves it if you could put on a, a a slavic slash german accent and just beat him senseless he'll love it look at him he's blushing he's, his face he's is like clashing with his hair he's already got his hair the first night of the honeymoon as well hasn't he we've all seen that oh, yeah that <laughs> man, he's coming out. <laughs> just just think of her as east prussian chris <laughs> Uh, she's not remotely offended by that. <laughs> Chris isn't shaking a cocktail either. <laughs> Would you like me to dress up as um, one of those girls from what was it, the Eurovision Song Contest? The, the oh, Polish, the Polish milkmaids. <laughs> <laughs> he can't even look at the camera. <laughs> God, Chris is going to go and have a wank while the rest of us get off. <laughs> I'm out of socks. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> James was heard to utter the words, I should have gone for the cheese party after the Field of the Cloth of Gold bombed. Let's go to... Let's go to Heather now, birthday girl Heather, um, because... And Alina, you'll need to have your mic on for this for reaction, because... For those of you that don't know, Alina is the biggest carnivore in the world. Alina likes meat. She will put any form of meat in her mouth and love it. Um, so, Heather, with that in mind, you are her litmus test for this party that she's going to talk about, okay? She's wiping her, she, she's actually snorted her food through her mouth and wiped her face with a face mask. Right, okay. Are you ready, Alina? Because Heather's going to need... <laughs> How did you know I did it with... Oh, maybe I shouldn't have been so... I can't, can't find a tissue anywhere. <laughs> right, are you Ask ready? <laughs> right, we're going to test how much of a carnival you really are. Heather, take it away. Okay. So my night my night for the greatest night was uh, the uh, Han Manchu Imperial Feast in 1720. It was, uh, it was to celebrate the 66th birthday of Chang Chai, the emperor of the... Qing Dynasty, and I'm really sorry for some of the pronunciations. I have no idea. And was held in the Forbidden Palace. Um, it was mostly to to um, celebrate, like I said, a 66th birthday, but also to bring the people of the Han and Manchu ethnic groups together and resolve disputes. It was one of the largest and grand, grandest meals ever documented in Chinese cultural history. Lasted for three days and consisted of 196 main dishes and 124 snack dishes for a total of 320 dishes sampled over three three days. That's a lot of food. Not a lot amount of time. Um, some of the, the dishes ex involved exotic ingredients and varieties of cooking techniques from all over Imperial China. It was held in both the inner palace for the royals and meritorious officials and in the outer palace for the rest of the officials. It was said there was 32 delicacies, which referred to the more exotic, exotic ingredients used. There was eight mountain delicacies that included camel humps, um, bear paws, monkey brains, ape lips, leopard fetuses, rhino tails, and deer tendon. Right, so go through those one by one. Ready, Alina? Okay, go on. Okay, so um, they had um, camel humps. No. <laughs> bear paws oh the poor bear who wants to kill a poor bear evil people keep going what if it was Wojciech 
nobody would be killing the beer drinking smoking bear. I hope not. Apeless. Unless you had the last bag. Right, hit me on. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Leopard fetuses. Ugh. Like, who would want to eat any sort of fetus? Like, let alone a leopard fetus. Okay, um, rhino tails? Mm. Could be You're thinking of foxtail soup, aren't you now? Yeah, so that's not too bad. I didn't, I didn't hear a no for leopard fetuses, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Nobody would eat a fetus. That's rank. Okay, and... Um, in a curry, be right. Deer tendon with um, white mold fungus. Sorry, what kind of fungus? I believe it's white. Sorry, it, it occurred later. Um, yeah, deer sinew with white fungus. It's like mushrooms, though, right? That's not sure. a mushroom, is it? Mushrooms are fungus, yes. No, but... I would eat mushroom as a fungus, but like this other fungus, what is this fungus? I'm not quite sure. I might not be going near it unless it's a mushroom. That's literally all it said was white fungus. So So for the purpose of this, for white mold, let's say like the mold that grows on cheese in your fridge, would you lick it? No. (laughs) I'd lick the cheese because I love cheese, but I wouldn't lick the white mold. That's, That's right. No, no, no. Okay, so then there was um, <clears throat> there was eight land delicacies, which included dry, dried sea cucumbers, shark fin soup, bird's nests, which I looked this up and was thoroughly disgusted, which are edible bird's nests made by edible nest swiftlets, Indian swiftlets, and other swiftlets using solifi- solidified saliva, which are then harvested for human consumption. I gagged a little when I read that. I think what you're, what you're supposed to do is that when you put the bird's nest, you boil the bird's nest in water, and then the dried saliva and stuff acts as like a stock type base thing. Yeah, it's a soup. But oh, you that makes from... sense. So I just had bird and spit written down in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, some of the other dishes aren't as bad. Um, and then there's others that sound absolutely awful. Um, they had roast salmon. Sounds delicious. They had uh, wensai tofu, egg tart, which is like a custard tart. Um, beast, bleh, beef tenderloin and oyster sauce. Whole yeah, suckling he's totally hands. down for that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> in. <laughs> then they had live monkey brains. Live. So, what is the mechanics of this live thing? So, you tie the monkey down, cut the top of his head off, and just start eating. Uh, it didn't specify, but I'm assuming you would have to because the monkey would probably try fighting you. Yeah. I would think. At least until the frontal lobe's gone. I'd, I'd guess so, Heather. Like, seeing that you were telling us a minute ago that you couldn't put eye drops in your cat without it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm assuming so, you know, that it's gone down right. somewhere. Um, goat brains, it did not specify whether alive or dead. Um, steamed camel hump in fish maw, which are the fish swim bladders. Um, but then they had denzo, denzo raised, braised chicken, which is basically a deep fried chicken, which is slightly burnt, but it's got mushrooms, soy sauce, cloves, um, a plant from the ginger family, um, cardamom, fennel, malt sugar. Sounds good. She's making her hungry now. She can't get decent Chinese in Poland. Then they got Peking Duck. Do not get me started. (laughs) Um, Peking Duck, which is ducks that are specially bred for the dish and slaughtered after 65 days. She's really getting hungry now. (laughs) They're seasoned before being roasted in a closed oven, and they're eaten, it was eaten with spring onion, cucumber, and sweet bean sauce with pancakes rolled around the fillings. So, yeah, that sounds delicious. Oh, my God, um, I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> Hold that thought. Carp tongue with bear paws. Um, shark fitting crab stew. Whole suckling pigs. I'll pass on that one. Um, they also had other wild animals such as badgers, bats, beavers, civets, cranes, 
crocodiles, foxes, geese, swans, partridges, um, ostrich, magpies, pheasants, quail, rabbit, rats, deer, turtles. Good thing about having geese is that the, ne- the necks come in handy for later. <laughs> oh, Chloe, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, prawn kebabs, which sound sounds delicious. Uh, shiitake mushrooms with pine nuts, sautéed conch, abalone with asmanis flowers, um, squid and mallard wraps. Sounds pretty uh, progressive. Um, coral, which I'm not quite sure how that works out, but I'll go with it. Um, lotus roots, a whole host of. Um, nuts and fresh fruit like um they had fresh dried candied pomegranates loquats lychees longans peaches ginkgo cherries kumquats melons plums sugarcane water chestnuts cashews almonds and walnuts so good chunk of that would kill me um frost preserved persimmons um sesame paste mochi rolls stuffed pancakes a wide assortment of dumplings, both savory and sweet, hawthorn jelly, honey tomatoes, and jujube puddings. And they ate off of finely crafted bronzeware, silverware, and porcelainware. And some of the porcelainware was in the shape of, of the animals that they were eating. Um, master intram- instrumentalists played music for the diners. And when the feast ended, everybody reserved some sw- got some swag. Didn't say what it was, but they got some. So that was my vote for the best time. I would say half the time would be great and the other half wouldn't. (laughs) It's definitely a meal and a half. Clive says Chris's beaver is good, but would Alina eat it? Clive, you're a (laughs) wrong (laughs) one. Oh, this is why you get into trouble, Clive. Uh, Right, okay. I want Alina's verdict on this. Overall, are you excited about that banquet? Some of the things sound really interesting. I mean, I wouldn't touch the bear or the brains or killing any live animals at the table. I mean, come on. You need to you are a love massive animals. fan of China and Chinese culture, aren't you, and Chinese food? Oh, I love China, Vietnam. I love the Orient Thai. All the food is, like, to die for. But obviously, living in Poland, nobody here knows how to make even a decent spring roll. So... Um, yes, love Chinese culture. I just don't like the weird stuff. I mean, I'd try it. I'd, I'd try anything once, but maybe not the live stuff. That's a bit gross. Anyone in the room up for live monkey brains? No. After a few beers have been had? Charlie's a vegetarian and just looks scarred by this whole experience. I'm just glad there was tofu, or else I'm going home hungry. <laughs> not Sorry, even Charlie. in a remake of Indiana Jones and the Temple of whatever it was. No. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie could have always had the unspecified white fungus. I'm always up for that. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> That's corn, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Holmes. I, I, I'm not convinced by this one. There's a lot of food. It's a bit weird. Um, but the, the main the main reason, there doesn't seem to be any mention of booze. We're well, Surely that's a constituent part of the best night out ever, surely. And you'd probably need quite a bit to get 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 some of this down you to be honest like in a fountain <laughs> <laughs> didn't say anything about a fountain sorry guys but the, the menu is quite extraordinary um yeah i've got nothing else to add really matt you up for trying any of this well to to quote chow young fat if you want to be asian you got to eat the strange stuff um so if you're going to love the food, you've got to give it a go. I've been doing the math. So 320-odd courses over three days, say 12 hours a day, it's about nine courses an hour. That's not bad going, you know, providing you get the small stuff and you work up to the big stuff. And then, you know, lots of food, lots of tunes, and then you get presents at the end. It's not sounding terrible. It's, you know, it depends on what the swag is. If it's, you know, <laughs> the rest of the monkey. Not not great. Um, I I, I, I don't know. It just it just it just seems it seems a lot. But didn't Jonathan Clements talk about you can do something like this now in Beijing when he was last on? 
you can do like a massive feast. I think so. I wasn't yes. asking. Did someone do it about 15 months ago when they had the mm. bat and the badger. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, didn't, they didn't survive the experience. The preoccupation in the chat is still with Chris's beaver. Uh, he says there is no beaver in Medway. He's you don't want to go near Medway. Snorting his drink <laughs> through his nose right now. Uh, right, okay. Um, I like that one. I like the idea that not everyone has just gone for a piss up. I see Merrin is about to empty the claret jug, which can only mean good things. I'm just going to gradually leave her longer and longer in the hope that she's more off her tit by the time we get there. Uh, let's go to Charlie who's now officially scarred and in no doubt that she is 100% a vegetarian after listening to that. Mate, I don't regret my life choices. I'll tell you that after hearing, oh, oh, no one wants to eat that stuff. Um, Okay, so before I start, quick question for Holmes. 17th century music is in the public domain, right? The The original composition of it is, yeah. A recording of it, if it was done in the last 50 years, might not be. Okay, then I won't risk it. Imagine, (laughs) imagine some beautiful Baroque music plays. So I don't want to get anybody in trouble. The date is the 18th of July, 1668, and you have been invited to a party at the Palace of Versailles. The Sun King, Louis XIV, wants to mark the signing of the Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle and celebrate his victory over the Spanish. He's fond of those. He's just acquired some shiny new territories in Flanders and he's marched back with his army to his home at Saint-Germain and he's dreamed of creating the palace to end all palaces at Versailles. Anyone who's visited Versailles will know that Louis's ambition was more than realised. But back to our night out. For a start, this is a novel treat because the French court has not yet made its permanent move to Versailles and it's very much still a work in progress. However, some parts of the building would be recognisable today for your fellow revellers on this sun-drenched afternoon in July. You're lucky. You're one of the king's favourites. You brush past the crowds queuing for entry outside the palace gardens. There are 3,000 in attendance tonight, and even the Queen of France has to wait half an hour before she's let in. But hey, if you want to see Versailles, you have to queue. It ever was, and it ever shall be. Though as a sidebar, if you're only going in to take a selfie and not to look at the art, do me a favour and fuck off to the Champs-Élysées. Thanks. <laughs> Some foreign ambassadors didn't even make it in at all. So you are extremely lucky to be so highly favoured. Louis has spared no expense for this party. You see, he threw one back in 1664 and he wants this one to be even better. He spent the astronomical sum of 117,000 livre on making this a day to remember. Now, that's a third of the entire annual operating budget for the palace. So he spent big on this. First, you're escorted to the newly built Dragon Fountain. Louis himself shows you the python killed by young Apollo's arrow, surrounded by dolphins and by cupids riding on swans. The water jets 27 metres up into the air before you and crashes down into the basin beneath. As your stomach starts to rumble, you walk through avenues of newly planted yet unfeasibly mature trees to the Star Grove for a lavish afternoon tea. The star grove is so called because of the neatly manicured greenery arranged into the shape of a star. Today, the grove is filled with mahogany furniture, dresses laden with every kind of delight the French court has to offer. There are veritable mountains of food, meats, fruits, sweet delicacies, and numerous carafes filled with the most delicious and potent liqueurs you've ever tasted. The late afternoon summer sunshine warms your skin as warm liquor licks you from within your veins. The sound of polite conversation and gasps of delight at Louis' spectacle begin to melt into flirtations and laughter. You're too tipsy to walk to your next stop of the day. So Louis arranges a fleet of coaches and sedan chairs to ferry his guests to a crossroads in the gardens where a trompe l'oeil theatre has been built just for the occasion. The theatre is lit by 32 crystal lamps. It's hung with tapestries and covered with a blue canvas richly decorated with fleur-de-lis. As you look to the stage, it seems that the background is entirely real and limitless, its horizon appearing to be as far from you as you know the real horizon to be. 
you shake your head in wonder and a periwig tickles your shoulders. Moliere has penned a play especially for you and for your fellow guests. It's called George Dandin or The Astonished Husband and it's a raucous tale of a cuckolding that makes you roar with laughter. In the play, a peasant marries above his station, I know, and finds it a most strange experience. His wife betrays him, so he decides to drown himself in one of Versailles' many marvellous fountains. However, the cuckolded husband decides that instead he shall drown his sorrows in drink. Classic. You'll spend the rest of the evening saying, you asked for it, George Dandin. Whenever a friend takes a drink, it will be freaking hilarious and will last many months, like when everyone used to say, waza. <laughs> your entertainment at its end, you make your way with the court back to the edge of the Star Grove, where a large octagonal hall has been crafted of trellis with a rounded roof that opens to the sky above you. The light is starting to dim into that romance of a summer evening and a beautiful glass is thrust into your hand with the best wine you've ever tasted. It's time to feast upon the largest buffet you have ever seen, eating from tableware of solid silver. You eat and you drink and you gossip some more. Your friend calls for his glass to be refilled and you cry, you asked for it, George Dandin. After dinner, you move to yet another octagonal temporary hall erected for the evening's ball. To get there, you walk through a gallery of greenery closed off by a rookery cave created by the king's gardener, Laveau. It's covered with marble and quartz sparkling above you, and you pick at the fruits that have been hung from the trees. They're hung there solely for your enjoyment. Oranges brought from Portugal are the night's greatest novelty, strung from branches by pretty ribbons. You keep a ribbon or two as mementos and rub orange peel behind your ears. At the ball, you are the most sought-after guest upon the dance floor, owing to your masterly knowledge of the French courtly dancers. Tired and drunk, your eyes are aching from so much beauty, and you think the night is winding down when Louis summons all of you to walk back through his covered avenue of trees and into the center point of his gardens. From where you stand, you can see a straight line back to his new palace. It's lit from the inside, and you've never seen so many windows in your life. It's as though the king has crafted himself a palace built entirely of glass, shining like a beacon in the dark French countryside. It must be nearly midnight by now. The sky is black, but you cannot see stars for the light emitting from the palace. Looking around you, you see that the statues and the painted vases that line the great lawn have also been lit against the night sky. Marble faces beam back at you and look just as animated as any around you. Then comes the first firework. It screams and explodes in colour above the palace. The display is the biggest and best you've ever seen and seems to be accompanied by the musicians whose violins have followed you throughout your magical day. As the glitter from the last firework fades, you clap your hands and cheer in appreciation before another explosion from behind you takes entirely by surprise. Well, if you're honest, you may have let out a tiny bit of wee because you are indeed very tipsy and were not expecting another round of fireworks to be set off from behind you. Louis is most amused to see all of your faces after his little prank. From that point on, the night becomes something of a blur. You know you dance more, that you definitely drink more, and that the beautiful replica of the palace built of marzipan has entire walls missing from it. You awake the next day on the grass, dew dampened and hungover, but full of the joys remembering the greatest night ever. Yay! And she has dropped the mic. Oh, that, that, that was very well done. Uh, even Clive looks excited by that decadent party, and he's a proper socialist. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, with this flashing porno light behind him, I love him so much. <laughs> Matt, are you down with this party, or are you going to piss on this one as well? A little bit French, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All the best things are, darling. All the best things are. To be fair, you had me into the Moliere, and I thought, oh, oh where's, my come car- on. where's my carriage? <laughs> um, no, I, 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 th- I think this is this is a good shout because you know it's, you know, when when the Queen has to wait her li- her turn in 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 the queue, you you know it's going to be a good gig, either that or she's fallen out with him again, which <laughs> did happen quite a bit. Um, no, I, th- I think that's pretty good. I. 
you know, disappointed there was no booze in the fountain. Yeah, yeah it's a bit of a shame. A 27-metre yeah. jet of wine would have yeah. been epic. Come on, Louis, you build the palace, put the effort into the booze. Yeah. Just out of interest, um, you miserable sod, what does constitute a party in Canada? <laughs> like what, ice fishing followed by some hockey and, I don't know, like chasing a moose or... What would yep. turn you on? Well, the moose. That's where you come <laughs> to think that Matt and I are probably not the best judges here. We're yeah, no <laughs> shit. Men, men of really? a certain age, yeah, with no imagination, just getting up in the morning is a struggle. Well, yeah. I, we, we're, we're talking we're talking about these incredible nights out, when all we just want to do is go to the pub. And have <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, to, you know, put, putting putting the judge hat on, um, you know, it, it, it seems it was a second attempt party if he tried it the year before. Yeah, Four years it, earlier, he wanted yeah. to be bigger. Yeah, you yeah. know, it, it sounds good for winning Flanders. Yeah, Flanders is nice. No, I think, I think, I think, all in all, Moliere aside, <laughs> um, being being dragged around in a chair, being drunk is, you know, it's like getting piggybacks from your mates on the way home from the pub, isn't it? So, yeah, it's not too bad. Well done, Charlie. Thank you. <laughs> Holmes, give us some credit. That was beautifully written. It, it, it was it was beautifully told. I'm slightly more drawn to it than others, but I mean, I have to say, I, I went on a work party once where, because you're only allowed to do it once a year, they tried to cram everything in, and it was started off. It was like a treasure hunt. Then it was cocktail making, and then it was a casino, and it, it all got too much for me. I was just like, can we just not sit in the bar? And I think I would find lots of elements of this would I end up thinking the same thing. But I guess. It was quite spectacular. A lot of the stuff hadn't been seen before, or if it had been, not commonly seen. I'm slightly intrigued about the uh, the, the rubbing orange peel behind the ears. I just thought it sounded like fun. It's the kind of thing I'd do. I like the smell of oranges. Before they uh, had been to Africa, Holmes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when I can go back to the pub, I might try that with a scratching or two. Oh, See. nice. <laughs> nice. Depends who you want to be sort of attracted to sniffing behind your ears. I mean, and, and the thing that really put me off, and I think you were implying this anyway, but the the constant jocular references to you asked for it, George Dandin, would really get on my tits. I think you had to be there. there. Yeah. You had to be there. <laughs> no, no. It's it's Moliere. It means it gets on your tits from the off. <laughs> We're cultural giants in this room. Right, let's go. I th- don't think you could get any further away from the decadence and extravagance and money spent at Versailles than where Alina's going to take us. Agreed. I'd just like to know, um, out of everybody who's sitting in the pub, who was, who was alive in 1989? Yay! Hey. Everyone except Beth. Uh, sorry, Beth. <clears throat> anyway, so I'm going to be talking about 1989, so only about, what was it, 30, my math is really off, 30-something years ago. So after the Second World War, Europe is carved up. Um, you've got the Iron Curtain dividing the East and the West. Germany also is divided at this point between the US, the UK, France, and the USSR. Not only that, Berlin is also split East to West. The West is divided between the British, the French and the US zones, and obviously the East is for the Soviets. In August 1961, um, the Soviets decide to build a wall in Berlin. And it basically they said it's to stop all the fascists from moving over to the the West. But the real reason was um, that they just wanted them to stop, stop entering. And anybody to stop moving. It took about two weeks to build the Berlin Wall. And it was built by the German Democratic Republic. More or less East Germany. Families are completely divided. Um, friends, you just can't get to each other. There's a massive wall. Um, and it causes some right old shit. Uh, October 1961, literally two months later, there is a quarrel. A quarrel between East Ge- an East German guard and an American official. Because the American official was going to the opera in East Germany. Um, It basically was a Wild West showdown. Uh, The US and Soviet tanks faced off each other at Checkpoint Charlie for about 16 hours. So this is uh, not a very good place to go. The war stopped the flow of refugees, but 
it diffused the crisis in Berlin, so it's kind of like a catch-22 situation here. Two years after it's erected, JFK visits Berlin. Uh, for those of you who know JFK's speech in Berlin, he makes a big mistake. Instead of saying, I am a Berliner, which is what he should have said, he says, Ich bin ein Berliner. I am a jelly donut. So apparently JFK is a jellied donut. The Berlin Wall, 171 people are killed trying to get over the wall. But on the plus side, about 5,000 managed to get over the wall. They do various things like jumping out windows, climbing, literally scaling the wall, uh, air balloons, climbing through the dirty sewers. But we're not talking about the early days of the Berlin Wall. We're going to 1989. 1989 in February, Poland is rising up against the Soviet regime. Their solidarity talks in for a free election over the summer. Hungary launched mass demonstrations in March. In May, the Austrian border is dismantled. All the barbed wire is taken down. In August, two see, I think this is so awesome. Two million people in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania form a 370-mile human chain across the Baltic. I think that is just absolutely awesome. At this point, the Iron Curtain is failing. So what is happening in Germany? Well, protests begin in East Germany in October 89. By the 7th of November, the East German government has resigned. On the 9th of November, very important date, ladies and gentlemen, this is when the Communist Party announced a change in city regulations in Berlin. Starting at midnight, you can cross the border. East and West Berliners basically gather this masses, thousands of people gathered at the, at the, at the wall. They're all drinking their beer, drinking their champagne, getting pissed, playing music, and they're chanting, Tor auf, open the gate. At midnight, they all flood the gates. Over two million East Berliners visit West, West Berlin at that moment. It is the greatest street party in the history of the world. The wall is dismantled. People are buying it, selling it. There's a prime example at the Imperial War Museum. Families are finally reunited. There was a woman uh, 30 years earlier. Her husband took the baby and escaped to West Berlin. She hadn't seen her son for 30 years. Finally, she got to see her son. Parties would last for days. And I found a really, really, really good memoir. So this is Liz Johnson Arter. Um, she says, uh, quote, but that day, the 9th of November, I was on a bus going to Berlin and the motorway was full of these cars. It seemed like everyone who had a car in the GDR was trying to get to West Berlin. They were stuck on the motorway for three or four hours and people were just going crazy. It was frantic and euphoric. People were beeping their horns, some had flags. We had a Western license plate, so people were trying to get in touch with us. They said, do you know what? There is no border anymore. You can just go. And everyone just went. And we happened to be in the middle of it by accident. No one knew this was going to happen. They just announced it. There had been a lot of demonstrations, but to actually open the border was something that nobody had expected. People were suddenly allowed to come and go wherever they wanted to. It was crazy. The closer we got to Berlin, the madder it was. But we couldn't just turn around because we had this game. She was a, a, a sportswoman. By the time we'd reached Berlin, all entry points from east to the west were full of people going crazy. So they cancelled our game. So we just walked around. The weirdest thing was that the border was open, but the same guards were at the border. You just had some kind of checkpoint, but instead they were being really horrible to you. Instead, they were being really nice. I had friends who lived right next to the wall. People with hammers were trying to get pieces of it that they would sell at the flea market. I saw an American tourist who bought a piece of the wall for 300 Deutschmarks. And it wasn't just East Germans who could come. Polish people could come as well. There was a Polish market that my friends used to go to because that's where you'd get, wait for it, ladies and gentlemen, cheap champagne. The Polish are clever folk. <laughs> I know we are. I like them. Everyone does. They used to have these cigarette machines in Germany where you had to put in Deutschmarks, but they figured out that their lotters were far less valuable worked as well. So they emptied all the cigarette machines. You couldn't get any cigarettes in Berlin in the machines because the Polish had got them all. 
So for me, it is the Berlin Wall. Um, and also I have a personal connection. I was in Germany when the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, I was four years old and I remember the moment when all the bells began to ring through Germany and I turned around to my mum and I said, mum, why are the bells ringing in Germany? I don't understand because it was so, it, everybody was celebrating. It was, it was a moment that's imprinted in my mind forever. And um, who's going to explain to a four-year-old four year what the Berlin Wall is and why the Berlin Wall is coming down? So there we go. For me, the biggest party, which lasted for days, which so much champagne was drunk, so much beer was drunk, so much alcohol was drunk. People partied in the street for days because the Iron Wall is coming down. Thank you. Well done. Rounds of applause around the room. That's very well done. Uh, and very personal to you as well, which is why uh, you got to do it and Lockie didn't. But he's over it already. He's over it. He is. Uh, OK, uh, let's find out which of the miserable sods we've put in the judging chairs today is going to go first. Matt, go on. Two words, Alina. David Hasselhoff. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is no party in history that has been good to the soundtrack of David Hasselhoff. <laughs> Look, wouldn't you be celebrating if you finally defeated communism or I? <laughs> I would be. I would be drinking so much vodka that would be coming out of my ears. I mean, I know you were four, but I kind of assumed you were anyway, given that you're Polish. I mean, did they not just, like, put it in your bottle when you were a baby? You showed me that um... supermarket aisle. <laughs> Do you know what? And that was a small supermarket as well. <laughs> <laughs> I love that they have a vodka aisle. Yeah, it's literally, what it is, it's all crystal clear, so it kind of, like, shines in the light. It's so cool. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Um, no, I, I, I remember this. It was, it, it was, it was quite something, considering for the, the, the few days beforehand, everybody thought it was about to be the Third World War as well. Um, it, um, I think this is a really good shout. Um, it looked like it was, you know, Berlin's a party city at the best of times, and they don't really need an excuse to, 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 to hang one out, and they certainly did that night. Um, music aside, um, because good music does come out of, uh, out of Berlin, it's just not Hasselhoff. Um, no, I think that was a really good show. I think that's, that's a, a strong, strong contender. Well done, Alina. No meat in it, which was a bit disappointing. It was missing a wine fountain as well. Really. <laughs> yes. Thank you. you. You lose marks for a wine fountain. I, I agree. I think that's a really strong one, as in, and, and it works on a number of levels. A, it was a massive piss up. B, a load of people suddenly had freedom, you know, which they hadn't had for ages against their will, etc. I think it's a, I think it's a really, really strong contender. I think you two better need to take cover because Beth is angry, man. You you slated her for a wine fountain. Well, also I think <laughs> the, the sheer number of people that were able to take part in it and experience the joy and it wasn't like a rich man show off thing which like a lot of the others have been I think as well I think that's what makes it seem slightly different yeah great it should a, be a really spontaneous worried. party is always better than planned fun sorry Beth go on. Say you should be really worried because I'm quiet <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're not sharing your chocolate so yeah. I never share my chocolate <laughs> right uh, let's go to... Who have we got left? Who hasn't been... Lockie, Clive. Should we do Merrin now before she really does lose her shit? So Merrin is like... She's got to the point where she's just sticking her tongue out at people. She's quite merry. She's quite um, side effect up from her vaccine. Let's say that. This, this is Pina Colada and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's four days after the vaccine and I'm just wishing that... Yeah, fine, whatever. Okay. This is a hypothetical. Are we prepared for a hypothetical? Yes? No? The fact that Hope's chair is empty is a bit disturbing. <laughs> Where's he gone? <laughs> oh, oh, were you at the fridge? Ah, oh, he was at the fridge. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, hadn't, I hadn't drunk anything yet, and I thought I might understand this a bit better with a beer inside me. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're going. We're going for a hypothetical. All right. You ready? <laughs> we have the poet's hat on. Right. We'll see if we can work this out. Shall I compare this to a fool's soiree? It would be more lovely and more temperate. The best night in history is a night out in 1616, the 23rd of May, the day before he dies, on which my friend invites us to drink, eat and contemplate. 
I know you think his work is boring, but I would say it is rivaled Playman's Fair. So my friends, come, let me take your hands, and I will take this time machine back to meet Bill's cast, his characters compare. These men, these boys, no girls upon these boards. A band of brigands, pirates, lovers, fools. Lions, no, but donkeys cannot be ignored. Witches, kings, this man writes, not by the rules. So long as all the world's a stage for Bill, so long tonight shall we be moved by William's quill. Let us sit, the tables laid with drink and meat. Yes, Bill sighs hard, but he has RSI. The quill sometimes does not write so neat. This evening we must, as his friends, his stories scry. Here's Scotland's hero at the door. All hail that gentleman, a general by his ken. Sir Duncan, king, is Macbeth tied and veiled, fearless in his firm fight with noble men. We see the adoration upon his brow. Sit, Macbeth, tell us of your plans. The king, I hear, puts ox to Macbeth's plough. My lord, how is the court and vote in hand? The rumour sits as rumours often do that Macbeth's plans will Scotland break anew. Chieftain, lift up thy skirts. We shall drink a toast. That pleated kilt hides more than one fast tart. Tis warp and weft tip tips me uppermost tonight. Tis Macbeth's shitty way to broken hearts. See, Macbeth knows that votes from women count, and votes are what he counts upon the most. If Duncan's charge of lands he could dismount, then Macbeth's king could royal lineage boast. His wife, a wicked wench, she eggs him on. Not counting chickens much before they hatch, I see no victory in his face, tis forlorn. And racked by guilt, has Macbeth met his match? Bill. Macduff, you say, his days are numbered two, and of Macduff's fine children there is no news. Well, let us turn then, and grunt and flatulate. Budge up, there's more than space here for all. I'll get the tavern boy to fill our plates, and we'll see who next comes into the hall. Why, tis the dame, the man, the king, the muse. Words, words, words. He feasts on food for thought. And as men do when words make one long peruse, Hamlet's, Hamlet's whiter shade of pale holds well at court. To be or not to be. Bill, come on. Were you on drugs that day? Slings and arrows. What, did bows not come to mind? You wrote about outrageous fortune, but you really lost your way. In a sea of troubles, I think it's fighting sailors you should find. Come on, you made him seek revenge for seeing ghosts. Hamlet's not your finest work tonight, my host. Now, please, put down your tankard, William Do. Make room for the king whose work does make me smile. My lord, a king whose madness makes much falsehood true. Tis Lear who sits now tonight and no doubt will stay a while. Pray tell, my king, your kingdom serves you well. The gossip is that Lear, his daughter, has put aside. Stormy skies on the horizon, so they say. I've heard them tell. Bill, isn't, hang on a minute, isn't this another one that died? My lord, how fares your mind? No madness recently, or have we been wandering in the wilderness again? Your man, the Duke of Gloucester, he stumbles now as one who cannot see, but we'll see Gloucester sets his sights on, I'm sure, on meaning once again to explain. When Bill unclothes the man, the naked king, then beggars would the mirror image bring. As some might say if pushed, there is here a hero certain. A character so finely flawed from Bill's pen that from the start, he leers not, but he leans. Is that you, et tu, Brute, Mr. Burton? By the bar, sinning and winning Cleopatra's heart. Elizabeth, Elizabethan, Shakespeare's tailored, feisty chronicle of love. He's not alone to walk like an Egyptian, but seeking solace then to roam with orders from above. Tis Anthony who takes tonight Caesar's prescription. William, such a spiritual journey to, fa to fall and fail from your quill. A world of politics, that aster asterisk that asterisk, those obelisks, the statuary looking down, those unseeing eyes that take their, feel, their fill in Colosseum, gladiatorial risk. William, my friends here believe tis the play's the thing, but they know your, woke, your work as verbose and boring. So, enough, Bill, this doom and gloom we might despair. We're here to drink this night and sing praise of lighter words. 
So introduce us to some of your maidens fair, the tight breast robins, the pouting fledgling birds. Let us gasp for theatrical purposes at least do. Tis sunlight through yonder window breaking. Will you killing me here with suns and moons, pale with grief, not exactly conducive to love making. She speaks, and yet she says nothing, unlike any girl we know. Come on, Will, where's your romantic gene? What with Tybalt being killed by Romeo? It's not Steve Wright's love stories. I mean, could you not a romance create in your portfolio? Could not even the friar have entertained Benvolio? Dear God, this is a tavern bereft of drink. Wait, wait, who is this wench that wafts anon? Her skirts a swirl aloft this manly stink. Oh God, it's Portia! Brace yourselves, she never caught on. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from who cares where. Bill, Bill, Bill. You must have been all up all night on that one, chained to the pen, the paper dripping to twaddle spill. Although, hang on a sec, here's a man. Okay, a pound of flesh hung limp, but crowing cock. Yes, here's a chap who'll get tonight's party planned. It's the Usurer, the Usurer. Who is it? It's Shylock. Unpopular, but away with puns. Remember his rats? That speech with land rats, what, water rats and pie rats? No, Will, you have a way with words, but Shylock's boring. This isn't a night out at all. How might we spice up this evening, Bard? Who might we bring into this drinking hall? Give your head a wobble, Bill, or did you Rosencrantz discard? Uh Uh-huh. Move the tables, make a larger space. There's one character who cannot be forgotten. Your smartest pun will in history it definitely needs a place. You bring in the donkey, that greatest ass known as Bottom. Oh, William, you know how to make an audience happy. Yes, no, the tavern's rocking. It's a night, all right. I take it back, or perhaps there was no wacky-backy. Maybe your genius did through quill to paper right. Maybe, perhaps we should not fix the book to Long Dead Marlow. You might just be the greatest playwright we've ever known. And lo, the tavern man calls time, the candles dimming, even witches born to wreak their wrath upon a heath are drinking up, reflecting on their cauldrons brimming, with toil and trouble a cocktail they bequeath. Upon this troubled band of merrymakers, thieves and shills, good fellows, one at least, to spend time with in your mind, if between the lines you understand that Will, our host here, is a man who is a rare, rare find. A writer who the common man and kings both knows. A poet who commands the winds and alters tides and seas. A bard who paupers, princes, brings to show. A story that can be told by anyone who reads. My friends, I give you Shakespeare's legacy. It is no small delight that he makes it possible to meet a cast of thousands each and every night. Wow. A huge round of applause. I'm not quite sure why you did it wearing a plastic safari hat, but oh my god, I feel, <laughs> do you know what? I just feel so bad because I feel like all of that effort and all of that cultural uh talent and the brilliant rendering you've given it is completely wasted on these two old farts. Uh, Beth, let, let's go to Beth first because she's like moved to tears by this. Beth, are you happy? Oh, I'm so happy. Merry <laughs> night faultless absolutely faultless it, it's on a peg a level pegging with uh charlie's uh disney renditions oh, oh okay very yeah. very very like absolutely both absolutely perfect in my eyes perfect charlie you were appreciating it as well right? oh my god i miss the theater so much like <laughs> i actually got a little bit emotional marin that was fucking incredible just yeah if I had my hat on, I would take it off. You should take take your hat off briefly to yourself. You should see what I was procrastinating about earlier to write that shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and on that note, let's go to the judges who aren't going to be nearly as, as appreciative of Bill, are you, Holmes? I'm not sure what it was about. Was it the 4th of April 1981 when Bucks won Eurovision? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I started, oh, notes. God. I started writing notes and then I was like, there's no point. I don't, want I don't know where this is going. <laughs> oh, Alina looked like she enjoyed it as well. It was very well delivered. I like a bit Shakespeare. 
Boney, are you sold? I'm I'm quite, I'm with Holmes. I've literally written not a clue on my bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the world's um, a new yeah. avian hist- aviation historian. It's just like, I don't understand what's going on. There's words, but they don't make any sense. <laughs> But, but, I mean, the worst thing in its favour is that I didn't hear a single reference to a wine fountain throughout. Yeah, it. no wine fountain. <laughs> yeah. It's a hypothetical night out with a cast of thousands. Use your imagination. You know, I, I thought that was brilliant, man. It was fantastic. It wasn't until right to the end I went, oh, okay, fair enough. Um, but but, that's sort of, but, but, we're but. saying the best night out in history but that's sort of every decent night out at the theatre where we're conveniently forgetting the bad student productions of things we've been dragged to by our mates because no one else has bought tickets. <laughs> Honestly, there's no culture in this room, is there? Uh, <laughs> Merrin, they may not have appreciated it, but I'm pretty sure you're going get to be getting a call from the RSC at some point <laughs> about uh, turning up and rocking up when the library opens. It was fun and it was brilliant. And Beth now adores you. So uh, it wasn't in vain. It wasn't completely in vain. Let's go. Let's go to Clive next, because I want to hear the accents. In the hedonistic days before the financial crisis of 2008, the tabloid press delighted in tales of the excesses of city workers who, fueled by obscene bonuses and unconstrained by responsibilities, would flourish restaurant bills so large that they could have paid for a child's entire education at Eton, let alone have fed a normal family for years. Greed was good, and there was plenty of greed to go around. Lunch was not so much for wimps as an endurance event. Similarly, celebrities and billionaires would flaunt their good fortune, if not their taste, by throwing ever more elaborate birthday parties and weddings complete with thrones and animals, and the obligatory song by chart-topping stars. And yet, none of these could be described as biblical in proportion. And while these ridiculous and hideous displays of opulence and wealth, banners of inequality and reckless disregard for those less privileged, have been somewhat restrained by economic realism and the tabloid press that once fed them, None were brought to an end by the hand of God. And while some ended with bodies in a swimming pool or luckless kids drowning in their own vomit after after a surfeit of drugs, few ended with the death of the host and the loss of his kingdom. No, for a real party of truly biblical proportions, one needs to go back in history some 2,600 years to 539 BCE, and to the feast thrown by King Balthazar, sometimes known as Balthazar, for 1,000 of his close personal friends. Let's just pause for a moment and reflect on that number. In 539 BCE, the world's population was not much more than 1% of today's population. And so, in relative terms, this was one big mother of a party. Parties were not unknown. His predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had also been noted for his parties and had been obliged to tone down his celebrations after complaints, not from the neighbours, but from God. Balthazar was not going to tone himself down. Like Posh and Bex with a fresh Hello magazine contract in their pocket, he went all in. 1,000 guests, food, drink, and entertainment. But this was not quite enough. He needed something more spectacular to impress his guests and to show how he kowtowed to no one, not even God. And so he demanded that his servants fetch the chalices, goblets, plates, and other ornamental and bejeweled crockery that the Nebster had half inch from the Temple of Jerusalem upon which to serve his lavish fare. So, there they all were, eating, drinking, and making merry, when suddenly a hand was observed writing something on the wall. Now, one might have been a little phased to see an apparently disembodied hand scrawling graffiti on the palace wall while a huge beano was underway. 
Belshazzar, Belshazzar certainly was. He tried to read the script. He couldn't. He called his advisors and various mystics in to read it. They couldn't. His missus leaned over. Have a word with Daniel. You know, that chap from Jerusalem that old Nebi brought over here in bondage with all the other ones. What? The one who told Nebi that his party was over the top? Yeah, that one. And so he did, and Daniel was brought in and shown the writing on the wall. So, what does it say? Mene, mene, tickle, or parson. You what? Mene, mene, tickle, or parson. Sake, clever clogs. What the fuck does that mean, then? You're not going to like this. Just tell me. Well, if you're sure. Mene means numbered, and tekel means weighed, and absarsin means divided, so mene, mene, tekel, absarsin means numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. What? What the? No, you're going to have to do better than that. That's just gibberish. Look, the writing is what one might call economical. The author has just put down verbs, you know, the doing words. The gaps in between aren't too difficult to fill in, however. If you, like me, are a genuine 24 carat prophet, well, fill them in or I'll fill you in. You're starting to bore me. This is my party and I want to get back to the booze and birds. <laughs> OK, OK. But I'm not sure you'll want to after this. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you've been weighed and found wanting. And, well, Parson, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Belshazzar, curiously, or due to his own enormous arrogance, was not too perturbed by this, and ordered that Daniel should be cloaked in purple and ranked third in the kingdom. Nice touch. Belshazzar got back to his parting, but possibly a little too soon, for before the night was done and before the party girls had collected their coats from the cloakroom, ordered their cabs and Ubers, and said their goodbyes, Darius the Mede smote Belshazzar and took his throne. Not the best end to a night out for poor old Belshazzar. But look at it from the perspectives of the other 999 guests, and Daniel, as well as out of Darius. Darius did jolly well. He had a night to remember and became king. Daniel got a purple coat, cloak, and very shortly a new position with Darius. Okay, he later got popped into the lion's den, but that's another story. And for the rest, well, just think about it. What a night. Not a party you would have wanted to miss. It must have been the talk not just of Babylon, but the whole of Mesopotamia and beyond for years, possibly decades afterwards. How many of us can truly say that we've been to a party when the hand of God popped up to spray painting on the wall? Well, not without consuming a few tabs of acid anyway. How many nights out have you been on that will be remembered for the next 2,600 years? How many parties have you been to that gave rise to an English cliché, the writings on the wall? How many parties have led to compositions by William Walton, Handel, John, Johnny Cash and Schumann, among others, and art by Rembrandt, John Martin and James Gilray, who portrayed Belshazzar as Napoleon? Or was it Napoleon as Belshazzar? In terms of standout parties, this caps everything before or since. Even the marriage feast of Canaan was quite, not quite so spectacular. Yes, it saw water turned into wine, but did not involve regime change. We know what the food and drink were served in and on, but what, I wondered, was actually served? I searched the internet. Well, one, one might think that Nebuchadnezzar and Balthazar with them involved, large bottles and quantities of champagne might have been flowing, maybe even in fountains, but champagne hadn't been invented then and wasn't for quite a few years afterwards. My research turned up nothing initially, but almost as though directed by a supernatural force, my attention was drawn, of all places, to the website of Widdicombe Sailing Club. <laughs> On that website, there is a page entitled Belshazzar's Feast. It recounts how Paul Hutchinson, accordion, and Paul Sartin, oboe, violin, and vocals, in their words, less confusingly known as Balthazar's Feast, 
had played for the club and that the menu was a choice of steak and ale pie, chicken ham hock and leek pie, or mushroom and spinach pie, all served with mash, selection of veg and gravy. It was utterly lovely and lots of empty plates were returned to the kitchen. And there you have it, a menu fit for two kings. Yes, without a doubt, Belshazzar's feast was the night out to top all nights out. Stand in. Um, <laughs> yet more round of applause uh, from around the room. Uh, I love that you just get more and more bonkers every week, Clive. It's brilliant. Uh, but I think, Holmes, did he have you at the pie at the end? No, no, I'm not that, you know, I like a pie, but it's not going to win me over that much. I mean, Clive, isn't this a story from the Old Testament? Not merely a story from the Old Testament, but there is actually, why one can pinpoint the date quite so precisely is that that is the, the year in which Darius knocked off Belshazzar and took his throne. But I think there's a principle here, is that we can't say that the, the best night out ever is in the Bible. Where's that going to lead us? I think that's a very kind of narrow-minded perspective on life, with all respect. I mean, this is a, a feast that has basically survived in memory for longer than any of the other feasts that have been talked about tonight. But mate, is, that because I mean, somebody, this is... is that because somebody made up the story of a ghostly hand appearing and writing stuff? Well, we don't know if anyone made up the story, but things happened. Daniel got his purple coat. Could it be less sceptical? Do we, do we really know what happened in the field of cloth of gold? No, we don't. We have to rely on what was written about it. Don't worry, that's, like, not winning, that's, not, that's not winning either. But, I mean, Daniel... Daniel... Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, how, how, so, Holmes, what you're trying to say is without documentary evidence, the whole Bible's a lie, right? Well, well there, there is. There are doubts <laughs> to that. I'm just thinking, on principle, we cannot, this group especially have the best night out being a story from the Bible. We'd never live it down. And also, <laughs> Daniel coming home with a purple cloak is just a mix-up in the cloakroom. We've all done that, that when, you, when you're allowed to leave. Sometimes the best nights out are when you come back with someone else's coat. <laughs> <laughs> Boney, what about you? Well, I've got the source sitting here in front of me in Daniel 5. And it actually, you know, Clive, Clive did it pretty well. He did skip the bit where they basically drag in anyone who's ever guessed anything ever to try to guess what's on the wall. Um, so you can imagine that being a bit of a downer, unless they're sort of getting, you know, tortured. Well, yeah. come guess on, something's on, on the wall, wall. chop. Yeah. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, Clive. Yeah, so you, I you've prefer asked, asked points like for that one. Nebuchadnezzar, um, <laughs> by the time Clive yeah. had finished it, it was right. Nebuchadnezzar, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I I don't know. You know, it wasn't a good night for Darius. He had to he had to wade through a big puddle. Um, you know, he got his shoes dirty, or whoever was carrying his shoes got them dirty. Um, he needed and, Daniel to put his purple cloak over that. Yeah. Puddle. Well, Daniel yeah. says, "I don't want the coat." He literally says that. You may keep your gifts and give your presents to others, and they still give him the coat. He's like, "Dude, it's a party yeah. bag. Come on." <laughs> <laughs> I I think I think it was. I think he gave more flair and verve to it than Daniel managed back in the day when he wrote about it. Um, and, and he was constrained. You know, he was constrained. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's sort of, you know, that very night, Belshazzar, the king was killed and Darius took over. And that's literally the end. You're like, okay, fine. But it's not as if, like, he was the only person who died. The city was being stormed by a bunch of angry people who'd been camped outside of it for quite a while. But also, in terms of, you know, if we break it down to the constituent parts, we want to see food, booze, music, fun. There's not much of that in this, is there? I think we were too hard on the wine fountains. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe that's what the ghostly hand was trying to write. (laughs) Wine fountain. (laughs) My God, I lo- I just love the, the. But you know, it just just on that, you know, it's it's right. Bring in all the people that can read this, and you just and it's the wife who goes, "Go get Daniel. He solves all this stuff all the time." No, 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 no. I've got somebody else. You can just hear her sitting there, like oh, with a glass of wine, saying, "Get Daniel. Daniel comes," and then you know she's probably happy. He was. But the husband was probably saying, "But he always mixes up his fucking cloakroom tickets. He's a right mate." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He left with my coat last time. That was a present from you. 
dear God, uh, where is the culture in this room? Where is it? Uh, well done, Clive. Well done for the accents as well. I like that we can now add it to the ever-growing uh, Cockney Emporium that is Clive Masterpiece Theatre. Uh, you're going to be able to do, like, the entire of world history in an hour and a half for school children by the end of this Down the Pub run uh, when lockdown finishes. It'd be brilliant. You can retire. You don't need to be a solicitor anymore and earn buckets of money. You can just do, like, pop it finger puppet theatre of the kids that would be great <laughs> right one last one uh lucky has got beef with someone else in this room tonight haven't you lucky um yeah no i wasn't too bothered about that because james didn't even do henry the eighth's best party so uh, how could it be the uh, the best one <laughs> in the world i i am um gonna look at king henry the eighth um but you know he's he's the he's what's going to be the thing that make him happiest it's having a baby boy isn't it so uh the birth of king edward would just uh, sorry prince edward the future king uh edward would just be the happiest thing ever and so the biggest piss up night out and happiest occasion for one of history's great party animals has got to be this and uh, we are a little bit short on documentary evidence which is why i'm absolutely thrilled to announce that defying lockdown and indeed the grave i am joined by king henry the eighth who <laughs> totally isn't a, a thing that i should bodge together with a, a book and a, 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 a printout at all so uh, king henry the eighth uh, is here and he's gonna Talk to me about about the, the the birth of his son and what a great party um, was was followed. Hi, uh, Henry, how are you? Hi. How are you doing, old buddy? Yeah, I'm good. Good. How are you? Good. Excellent. Not too fed up with being, you know, dead for 474 years. Oh no 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 no. Oh, cool. This is the uh, the the down the pub gang. Nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> first, I would like to just get to know you. Well, I'm, I'm sure there will be time uh, for that in a bit, but you know we're gonna we're gonna have a bit of a chat, uh, of course. Incidentally, has anyone ever told you you sound um, a, a little bit like um, Thomas Aquinas? What the 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 13th century <laughs> Italian theologian and philosopher? No, no, no. I'm, I wasn't really thinking of him. Make cats. What, the South African-born England rugby player who won the World Cup in 2003? No, I wasn't, I wasn't actually thinking about him either. Yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah so it's a little bit like uh, him, actually. You lie! No, it's not much of a lie. It's, it's fairly obvious. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. What we, we need to do is discuss a, a party. What do you want from me? Well, just to sort of back up a few accounts that I've read of the party after the birth of uh, Prince Edward, um, because that was a, a pretty big deal for you, uh, wasn't it? Yeah. How did you know? Well, it was fairly well documented uh, that you've had troubles in your life, uh, you know, prior to that point anyway. I mean, what was it you said to um, Pope Clement VIII in 1536? Look, I don't know you, and I don't answer to you. Yeah, fair enough. But then you bit trouble with your wives as well. I mean, not having a baby boy with Catherine of Aragon and then Anne Boleyn turning out to be a, a terrible traitor, uh, of course. So the whole business with her trial. I mean, did you say anything to her when, when she knew she was going to be executed? Get to the chopper! <laughs> straight, straight to business uh, then, I see. I mean, she wasn't the only wife of yours who uh, who got to the chopper, uh, though. Catherine Howard, uh, of course, very famously was was executed too. And apparently, her ghost haunts the Tower of London in the famous Screaming Corridor. I mean, have you had any experience of that? Yeah. Really? I mean, did you did you say anything back? <laughs> Don't fucking scream at me. <laughs> I see. Well, fair enough. I mean, you are renowned for your big parties, though. Uh, and this was must have been massive. I mean, if you could sum it up in in three words, say what what would they be? Outrageous, <laughs> fucking crazy. <laughs> I bet. I mean, uh, where where did this some um, massive party go down anyway? Do you want names and addresses? Well, I mean, you could you could give us a clue. Um, where do I come from? Well, uh, oh. I mean, I, I nearly said Austria for a second then. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
No, but uh, seriously, you're you're actually from Greenwich, aren't you? Absolutely, yeah. So that's where it was. Exactly. Awesome. I mean, I I used to run a pub in Greenwich. I like that. Brilliant. So, I mean, Edward was born on the 12th of October, 1537. I mean, do you, you must have started prepping this party before then. When did you get started? On October 7th. Really? So it was just a few days before. Um, Five. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's a pretty good timing. So let's go through a list of things uh, that you may have had at your epic party. I mean, I'm guessing tons of booze on a massive Greenwich pub crawl. Yes. Beautiful women? Yes. Uh, beautiful men? Yes. Beautiful non-binary defined people? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Um, incidentally, do you have a top chat-up line? Hello, cutie pie. <laughs> Simple, uh, but effective. Um, what about uh, fancy dress? Sure. Uh, did you have any fountains of wine? No. I'm glad to hear it because they don't like that uh, over there. What about jousting? Yes. Um, rodeo bull? Yes. Shot girls dressed as nuns? Yes. Roman Catholic taunting? Yeah. Peasant hunting? Yes. <laughs> Plus size dances? Yes. Did you have any French people? No, oh, no, 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 no. Really? You didn't have any French people there at all? Don't be ridiculous. Well. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, what about banging music? I mean, as much as green sleeves could ever, like, properly bang. I like that. Yeah, I know you do, but, I mean, you sure you wouldn't change it up for something a bit more modern, given the chance? Forget it. No deal. Yeah, I see. Well, what about a little bit of um, karaoke? I mean, you're musically minded, uh, aren't you? Let's, uh, would you give us a little rendition of something? Yeah, why not? Cool. All right. Well, uh, go then. What you got for us? Da, 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 da. Take out the papers and the trash, or you don't get no spending cash. If you don't scrap that kitchen floor, you ain't going to rock and roll no more. Yakety yak. Don't go back. Da, 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 da. Awesome. Yakety yak by the coasters. That 1958 hit single sound by him, sung by Henry VIII. Nice. So, what do you do when you <laughs> when it's time to start the party? You know, and it's you know it, it's on the day, and and what do you say to your courtiers? Could I speak to the drug dealer of the house, please? <laughs> so, I see you are a, a proper Greenwich uh, boy. Then, bit of a hangover afterwards. I rather than talk about it. Okay. Well, I can well understand that. Did anything, did anything seriously bad? Uh, happen at this event. My sunglasses were damaged. Oh, <laughs> how annoying. <laughs> okay, let's talk about food, because seriously, you, you love food, uh, don't you? Yes! So, what goes in to your perfect buffet? This is going to make us fat. Yeah, I know, but we're both pretty heavy guys, so, I mean, what, what would you say are your essentials? Pasta. <laughs> Pasta. Oh, well, you can take the boy out of Rome, but you can't take Rome away from the boy, uh, clearly. Uh, anything else? Sauerkraut. <laughs> That'll be the um, Anne of Cleves uh, influence, uh, possibly. What about dessert? Cookies. Well, <laughs> cookies. I mean, word on the street is that Thomas Cromwell was also a massive cookie fiend, and he was caught with his hands in the cookie jar, literally. I mean, uh, is there any truth in, in that at all? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was. All right. Well, I mean, what what did you what did you say to him? Put that cookie down now. <laughs> Who told you you can eat my cookies? Wow, that sounds like a trip to uh, to the Tower of London for him. Correct. And you know what that means, uh, of course. Get to the chopper. <laughs> exactly. So, well, I mean, listen, we're, we're drifting off topic a bit. So, so uh, let's wrap this up. I mean, Ch Charlie's here, though. She's a fan of food and the monarchy, just like you. Um, do you do you have any advice for her? You should not drink and bake. Oh, I, I feel I feel like that ship may have sailed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we don't have Marcus uh, here. He's um, 
he's a, he's a big fan of Sean Bean in in, uh, in in Sharp, of course. You know his most famous line, don't you? Bastard. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's the one. Well, it's been it's been absolutely amazing having you here, King Henry the Eighth. Um, do you uh, think that's the last time we'll we'll see you here? I'll be back. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Um, thank you very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure, King Henry. Hasta la vista, baby. There are many, many standing ovations in the pub and uh, sing- signals of we are not worthy. <laughs> um, oh, my God. I think, do you know what? I was like, when you sent me a message saying, James has taken Henry VIII, and then you said, but I'm not worried. I now see why. Um, <laughs> we have Beth uh, apoplectic, uh, uh, tears of absolute joy. Uh, poor Merrin, who put all that suckered effort into cultural fucking magnitude of her Shakespeare themed thing has just been shot by an app that plays Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, quotes. Arnie the Eighth. Greatness, James. Is it just me, or is Lockie's performance actually sobered Merrin up a bit? <laughs> I just think I think she's beyond even being pissed off that that beat her her cultural effort. Um, I am sorry, yours is much better than mine. The bar is being raised. She's <laughs> like, to be fair, Mary, you raised that bar last week or the week before. Yeah. And I think Lockie and his Arnie dashboard have met it. Um, <laughs> fucking hell, Matt had to take <laughs> Matt had to take his glasses off, Matt. I, 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 I thought that was utter, utter genius. No history, complete bollocks, but still, it was, it was absolutely hilarious. Um, uh, honestly, mate, well, well done. That was after after an evening of well, middling quality. This, yeah, let's be let's be fair. Um, that was that was absolutely smashing. And you know, the fact that Henry face planted before he got into his stride as well. He recovered. He recovered well. I love- no. God. I, and on a serious note, I mean, for a bloke who was renowned for how much he put away, I'm guessing that was the night to all, end all nights, uh, a healthy baby boy, you reckon? Or was Jane Seymour ill? I don't know. Yeah, she didn't She didn't live too much longer, unfortunately. So okay. I, I guess it would have been tempered by work. Plus, he wasn't the strongest looking baby in the world. He probably wasn't counting his chickens, to be, to be fair. But um, a, a, a boy is a boy. It's good to have an heir and a spare. But um, yeah. Yeah. Holmes? I thought it was brilliant. Um, it's the first Tudor one that I've heard on this that hasn't irritated me in some way. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did, uh, did even less notes for that than I did for Merrin, to be honest. So, uh... <laughs> oh, right, OK. Uh, we have done it. We have finished. We <laughs> Merrin says there's going to be a bloody mariachi band next week. Uh, yeah, it's not <laughs> Surprise me. Uh, I have decided that next week we're going to roll with Kit's suggestion of the worst family in history. The most bastard family you can find mm-hmm. in history. I think there's going to be some good ones coming up there. Uh, Merrin is now drinking wine out of the box, which is always a good sign. <laughs> uh. Right, okay, let's go around the room while the judges make up their minds uh, and find out as if there's any doubt, really, uh, who you would have gone for if not your own. Merrin? Lock, stock, and barrel. Charlie? Well, obviously, points for Beth for um, bigging up Charlie. Um, but two two brought me to tears this week. Lockie made me cry laughing. But Merrin, um, you know, just you, you have my heart. So Merrin for her beautiful ode to Shakespeare. I'm glad at least someone went cultural in the room. It makes me feel... I'm going to be the great the the that Merrin put in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Beth? I'm just blown away. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It looked like there was a point where you couldn't breathe halfway through that. I did I did stop breathing at one point. I did <laughs> stop breathing because I was laughing so much. Like, yeah. And, <laughs> um, oh, I can't pick. Like, everyone was like, Lockie was just fabulous. <laughs> but Merrin was as well. I just, oh, both of them. Both of them. There were questions being raised when you said that you were drowning in books. Uh, How much of your PhD got done this week, Lockie? To be honest, I've spent a lot more time on my course prep for for the weekend than I have on on this. This was 
quite a few hours, but yeah, um, <laughs> a little bit of time. I would have gone with you, but I just, uh, I, I do like it. But I have to say that if I'm going to go for a history one, Meryn's was hypothetical and yours was brilliant, but bollocks. Um, I'd probably, I'm going to give Alina a shout for the amount of effort that went into an actual like life-changing night in Europe for so many people um, and one of actual historical significance. I'm going to try, I'm going to be the other nerd in the room. Uh, James. I'm actually going to agree with you, Alex. I was going to go for Alina's as well, although to Mary and Lucky, a star for effort. Um, but yeah, Alina's 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the, just the amount of celebration for freedom and the end of fear in many ways. It, it just has to go up there. Ask oh, Kisser, going with the two of the <laughs> podcast. I like it. It has been noted and appreciated. Uh, Obi Ginge Kenobi. Oh no, here we go again. <laughs> we can't hear you. <laughs> This is everyone's favourite part of the episode, by the way, when we go to Chris and no one can hear him. No, we still can't hear you. He's going to go out and come back in again. Brilliant. Alina, what about you? You Well, I'm going to go with Heather because that was really fun and I got to interact with one and it was like, here, press this button if you like A. Press this button if you like B. (laughs) Press this button if you'd like to eat live monkey brains. Exactly. And also, please make sure you hold that recording where you said that you go for mine, because I would like that as a ringtone for when you call me. <laughs> so I set aside for the leader. Yeah. Right. <laughs> she's just buzzing as well, because she just sent me a text asking if she could have a Holocaust, uh, Holocaust episode next week, and uh, uh, next recording batch. And I said yes, but I, I do have to catch this in the fact that I know you're really excited about the May recording batch, but the rest of us literally finished the March one yesterday and just want to curl up in a ball and die now. So you <laughs> might want to temper your enthusiasm for a couple more weeks till we wake up again. That's fine. Back. I can do <laughs> Matt was like, can I have a break now? <laughs> yes, Matt. No, actually, no, you've got four episodes. I've got one tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, okay. Uh, Lockie, if you can't have your own. I thought Merrin's was beautiful and such a such a lift away from kind of a year of lockdown. It, it did feel like the theatre. It was just, just lovely and wonderful. Thank you. And you were the only person in the room that noticed she was talking in iambic pentameter and that she was doing sonnets and stuff. So you get girly swap points as well. Heather, what about you? Oh, I enjoyed Lockie's. I enjoyed Marin's. I actually remember Alina's because I was actually alive and although a year older, it was epic. I remember my parents talking about it for a long time, so I'm going to have to go with Alina. Cool. Obi Ginge Kenobi, are you going to go with Germany as well? Um, yeah, only because in mine I said that the Germans weren't the greatest party animals in history and Alina's proved me wrong. So yeah, 1989, definitely. You are absolutely shameless. Clive. I'm not going to go for either Merrin or Lockie because their presentations were so spectacular and they just raised the standard to a ridiculous degree, which is going to put the rest of us under a huge burden in the future to try and keep pace at all. I can see myself. It's your own fault. You've started this arms race. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's just going to be next week. I've got. I can do no bloody work. I've got to just focus on my presentation for this, and then I'll still not come in the top three. To be it's fair, just Clive, cruel. To be fair, though, Clive, you won't have to do any fucking research, so it swings around about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. But, I, again, I'm being a little bit hackneyed, and because I'm a creep, I'll go for Elena, because I too remember that evening. And I must say, of all the news stories that I've watched happening in my life, that was the one that was the most, that hit me the most emotionally. I'd been in Berlin a couple of years beforehand. I remember someone giving a speech at the conference I was at saying, one day the city, uh, Germany will be united. And us Brits all sat around thinking, that's just ridiculous, that won't happen. You know, this is how it's always been and how it always will be. And just a couple of years later, suddenly it did happen. And it was, and also because that was the most spontaneous huge party, whereas all the others were contrived. So, yep, Elena wins it. 
for me. I think the only other two things I remember to that extent off the news are Princess Diana dying, which is not a party moment, uh, and Nelson Mandela. I remember being sat in front of a television and not knowing why we were staring at the outside of a South African prison uh, for hours on end. But someone pointed out to me when I tweeted my COVID card the other day that my batch number is his prisoner number. There's some historical... uh, coincidence for you right okay well, another one for you alex go before on. you go Ert and senna you remember that and i remember that yeah Ert and senna so does matt as well that was horrible i i, I did that the other week and came second yeah, though. Was yeah. yeah. Did. Uh, if i'd have been asked to prepare and i wasn't drowning in recording 40 odd episodes this week i was either going to do um the council of nicaea because who doesn't love bishops beating the shit out of each other um, and then coming up with a document at the end of it that Bishop bashing. Christ was the son of God uh, so yeah you can listen to our uh, first birthday episode next Tuesday for some more fun on Bishop Synods and the crap that they get up to because <laughs> we had much fun doing that and that's the reason that we're a Bishop Synod destroying Voltaire in the cartoon uh, or I was going to do Mafeking week just because it seemed like everyone got really hammered and not that many people got hurt to justify it i'm glad that no one went down the boring ve day route or anything sensible like that um it's true to form i think judges what have you gone for it's a it's a unanimous decision i'll do the i'll do the second and third so in third place is beth this week wow she's surprised yeah that, that <laughs> sulking pay sulking paid off <laughs> He's not a message you want to reinforce. <laughs> um, in second place, it was Charlie. It was probably an epic night out, even if it wasn't to the judges' oh. taste. Thank you. And we 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 do have we do have a winner as as these things come down to. But before we announce our winner, we are going to give some honourable mentions because there's been two performances this evening that deserve an honourable mention. Um, the historicity of them is, well, non-existent, but they were a lot of fun. Um, the only thing that was more fun than these two performances was watching Marin getting slowly more and more wasted to the point she was drinking out of the box, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but Lockie and Marin, you guys smashed it tonight. That was superb. I might not be able to say historicity, but Marin can spell still, which is a good sign because she just put it into the chat. So well done, both of you. But now for our winner. And it was Alina because that would have been a great party. I would have loved to have been in Berlin that night. But yeah. A, a lot of sausage would have been consumed, I think, which would have made her very happy, which is probably why she went for it in the first place. Sausage and beer. Sauc- well, I don't drink beer, but sausage and vodka. Sausage and vodka. <laughs> <laughs> and David Hasselhoff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Is that your first victory? <laughs> My second. Second victory. The yeah. dogs are also very excited right now. I think they're. I, I think they're kind of puzzled as to why they're excited by the coming down of the Berlin Wall now. Uh, knowing the dogs, they are a bit dim, and I don't think they're going to get the cognitive reasoning behind why we're celebrating it tonight. But well done, congratulations! As I said, next week we will be because we always have lots and lots of fun when we do a historical worth. So, and we're going to stay weekly till the end of March. So we've got a couple more for you uh, before we decide what we're going to do. And next week we will do uh, history's worst family i can already think of a ton of borgias tudors all kinds of assholes that we can have coming forward for that one i know i know charlie's already thinking of the kennedys uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so join us for that i'm sure wherever clive goes in the world there will be cockney accents but let's see uh let's see where the bar gets raised to next week because i'm not sure there's much more higher that we can go after the arnold schwarzenegger uh app that Lockie has discovered. So join us for that.